ID the Future, a podcast about evolution and intelligent design. Is there free speech today to challenge Darwin in science education? I'm Casey Luskin with ID the Future, and today we have on the show with us Herm Bauma, who holds a master's degree in philosophy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a Juris Doctor from the University of Texas Austin School of Law. Herm has been a licensed attorney in Washington, D.C., and worked in international tax law and federal income tax law for over 40 years. In 1998, he formed the National Association for Objectivity in Science, whose primary purpose is to promote the balanced teaching of evolution in secondary schools and universities. So, Herm, it's great to have you on the show with us today. Thank you, Casey. It's great to be here to uh, join you in this podcast. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Now, Right now, it is the end of March 2023, and we just recently posted a very short, wonderful article you wrote titled, The Top 10 Scientific Arguments Against Darwin's Theory According to Darwin Himself. We posted this on Evolution News, and it's a wonderful little document that actually quotes Darwin admitting problems with his own theory, and many of these problems remain true to this very day. And before we get into the real story we want to talk about here in this podcast term, can you just tell us about maybe how did you come up with the idea to write this little article? And can you give us one or two of your favorite examples of those top 10 arguments against his own theory that Darwin himself admitted? Sure, I'd be happy to, Casey. About maybe five or six years ago, I was trying to think of an idea, a way to uh, talk to strong supporters of evolution to try to get them to... uh, open up their minds to listen to some scientific arguments against the theory. And I was trying to think, well, who, who would they listen to? I mean, they're not too inclined to listen to someone who, who's a supporter of design. And so I, I was trying to think of someone they would, they would open their minds, they would be willing to listen to. And I thought, well, it's one person they should listen to is Charles Darwin himself. So I decided to, to go very carefully through the origin of species. I spent a number of months going through it, like three or four pages a day. I, it took a lot of time just to go through it carefully, make sure I was understanding everything he was saying. And I kept notes to uh, keep track of every argument against his theory that he considered. And I tallied up 37 arguments against his theory. And uh, I wrote an article on that, his response to scientific arguments against his theory. And I considered all 37. And then uh, I got to thinking, well, that's for a lot of people, that's, that's a lot to read through. So I thought well, it would be good to kind of focus on the top 10. So uh, last year, I decided to develop an article that just focused on what I considered based on, on what Darwin said in The Origin of Species was my reasonable conclusion as to what he would consider to be the top 10 scientific arguments against his theory. So I came up with this list and uh, you asked what, what were the, of the top 10, what are my two favorites? I guess one would be the argument based on the flatfish the young uh, flatfish has an eye on each side of his body. But as he matures, as he grows, one eye migrates to the other side of the body. So he ends up with having two eyes on one side of his body, which is good because he spends most of his adult life lying on the bottom of the ocean with one side up. So some of the naturalists of his day, of Darwin's day, said you can't explain that through your, your mechanism of natural selection operating on randomly produced variations. Because, uh, you know, Darwin said that there were numerous successive slight modifications that took place over long periods of time to produce a particular organ or function. But he couldn't really explain how the, the eye began to move to the other side of the body, because if it just moved a little bit of a time, at a time, the fish was still lying on the ground in the sand and just moving a little bit, it's not going to provide any benefit. So basically, Darwin concluded his theory of natural selection did not explain that feature. And he admitted he, he couldn't explain that through the application of natural selection to randomly produce variations. So he said what it, his theory as to how it happened was it was produced by the flatfish getting into the habit of moving their eyes. So one would, when the young would be lying, or the, I guess the adult would start lying on the bottom, and he'd start stretching his eye to try to move one eye to the other side. And that happened many times. I, it wasn't quite clear to me how Darwin expected this to work. But he thought over m- many years, millions of years, through this habit of trying to move the eye to the other side, 
eventually that would be inherited. He thought it all happened through habit and inheritance. The second scientific arguments against Darwin's theory listed in my top 10 deals with neuter ants and their different caste. Darwin mentioned this species of ants that has fertile males and also some fertile females, but some of the females are not fertile, they're neuter, so they don't reproduce at all. Plus, another interesting aspect about this species of ants is that the neuter ants have different castes. They're different types of neuter ants. So one of the arguments raised was, how do you explain through your theory of natural selection the existence of these neuter ants with these like three different castes? And uh, he agreed it was a very tough question for his theory. He really tested the theory. But he, he thought somehow natural selection could apply to the fertile females and somehow produce, have an impact on the types of neuter ants that are produced. Again, he wasn't very clear as to how this happened, but he thought ultimately it could be explained through his theory. So in a lot of cases, he just kind of used his own speculation as to how his theory might work, but he didn't have any strong evidence that it could have worked that way. And your article goes through some other um, arguments that Darwin makes, some of which are more familiar to our listeners about the lack of transitional forms in the fossil record or the difficulty of evolving complex features. We'll leave that for our listeners to go and read, and we'll post a link to that great article on the podcast description. But I want to get back to why we're having this discussion today, Herm. You recently sought to present this information to the NSTA, which is the National Science Teaching Association. I always knew them as the National Science Teachers Association. And in fact, I attended one of their meetings in San Diego back in the early 2000s and heard Ken Miller and Eugenie Scott there speaking about intelligent design, bashing intelligent design and supporting Darwinian evolution. So when did they change their name from the National Science Teachers Association to the National Science Teaching Association? And, and why do they do this? Well, they changed it four years ago, 2019, I believe it was the year. And uh, I like to think they changed it to make room for me because I'm not actually a science teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not so sure about that, Herm, as we're going to find out. But can you tell us a little bit, what is the NSTA and, and what, what exactly is this organization and what happens at their meetings? Well, it's, uh, it's my understanding it's the largest association of science teachers. I think they have membership of almost 50,000 science teachers and also other people like academics or uh, administrators, not just the school teachers, but I think that's maybe the real reason they decided to change their name. But it's a huge organization. They have an annual conference, usually in the springtime, and they last like three or four days. They have a lot of speakers, and they invite the membership to submit proposals so the members themselves can speak at the conference or they have different ways to present. One is just to have a lecture format or another is to have a poster presentation, things like that. And they have other conferences during the year, but one big one, usually in the springtime. So I've been to a few of those. And the purpose of these conferences really is to help educate teachers about how to teach science. I mean, I've been to these and I remember there were lots of great sessions, some of them better than others, but lots of great sessions about how to help teachers to teach science better. So you've spoken at NSTA conferences in the past. Uh, tell us a little bit about those. Did you ever have any issues with those? Well, I haven't spoken at them in the past. I've attended the meetings, but uh, four years ago, I did try to speak at a NSTA conference in St. Louis, and I was approved. And my uh, topic was listed in the conference app and in the agenda. And I had a time, a meeting room all set. and I went to the conference and the morning of my, I was supposed to give my presentation. I went to the meeting room. I started setting things up like 15 minutes before I was to start my lecture. These three officials came into the meeting room and said, we're canceling your presentation. You have to, you can't proceed. And I said, why? What's going on? And they said, well, last night, somebody told us, somebody looking at the app, I guess, told us they saw my uh, session listed. And they wondered if they said it sounded like I might be promoting intelligent design to them. So they, the officials were notified and they decided to shut down my presentation. They said they took a look at my website and was promoting fake science. The only fake science I know on the website was a reference to Charles Darwin and his statement that he thought that the first forms of life were the product of the creator. Otherwise, I don't know why they said it was fake science. 
because the website just presents a lot of scientific arguments against Darwin's theory. Anyway, that was four years ago. They shut me down. And you were basically about to start speaking. And they came in, I think you said 15 minutes before your talk was set to begin. And they basically shut you down. They pulled you off the stage. Yeah, right, right. Well, you did a podcast interview on that here on ID of the Future. Maybe we'll have to dig that up and re-release it. So let's talk about your experiences this time around with you trying to speak at the NSTA, again, talking about Darwin's own arguments against his own theory. And what did Darwin say? Trying to help educate science teachers about uh, what Darwin said. Tell us what happened this time around when you tried to speak on this at the NSTA. Yeah, last September, I submitted a proposal to uh, speak at the March 2023 conference on the uh, the top 10 scientific arguments against Darwin's theory, according to Darwin himself. And then in December, I got an email from the NSDA conference team. They said that I was not approved to speak on the topic, but they wanted to invite me to do a poster presentation. And their email said that the topic was considered to be significant and of interest to your colleagues. I thought, well, that's interesting. I guess they're beginning to see the light here. But I was still a little bit wary of whether or not it would all come to pass. But they invited me to submit a poster presentation proposal. So I did in January 9, and then it was accepted. And starting in January, the poster presentation was listed in the conference app. And so I started preparing for my poster presentation and 50 copies of a handout. I attended a web seminar that the NSTA was offering for people who were presenting posters. That was on February 22nd. In February 24, I got an email from Tricia Shelton, who's the chief learning officer, that's her title, for the NSTA. And she said, in working with the session browser, we came across your session, and we were concerned that it might be promoting creationism. She said, will your session be promoting creationism? And I sent an email back. I said, no, it won't, it won't promote creationism in any way. It's only going to present what Darwin considered to be the top 10 scientific arguments against his theory. Then she sent another email back, um, I think February 28th, and said, I need confirmation from you that you won't be using intelligent design to challenge evolutionary theory. And she also wanted me to, in, as part of my presentation, she wanted me to show how each of those top 10 scientific arguments against Darwin's theory had been resolved through modern scientific evidence. And then she also asked me to send her a copy of my poster presentation, what it was going to consist of. So I got back to her and I said, I'm not using intelligent design to challenge Darwin's theory. I'm simply presenting what Darwin himself said, I'm using his own words. And I said that the, even the, the NSTA's position statement on the teaching of evolution said, although evolution is basically settled, there is a debate about the mechanisms of evolution. I said, I'm focusing on the mechanism that Darwin presented of the application of natural selection to randomly produce variations. So I'm showing that that is open to debate still. And the poster presentation will help teachers to more objectively evaluate the mechanism that Darwin presented for evolution. And then I attached a copy of my poster presentation. And I also asked her, I said, I'm not aware of any how any of these scientific arguments uh, have been resolved through modern scientific evidence. If I'm mistaken, could you please help me out and tell me how each one has been resolved? Because I'm not aware that they have been. So then on March 7th, she sent me her final email. And she said, basically, I looked at your presentation. All it does is present Darwin's words. I guess she had a problem with that. It does not provide framework-aligned teaching approaches. But nothing in the guidelines for poster presentations ever said you had to present framework-aligned teaching approaches. So it was obvious that she was just trying to find some excuse to cancel my presentation. She never presented any modern scientific evidence to resolve these arguments against Darwin's theory. She said, I have to cancel your presentation, and I'm willing to give you a refund. <laughs> well, that was very decent of them. Very, very decent of them to give you a refund. And of course... This is what we call shifting of the goalposts. You know, first they accuse you of teaching creationism, promoting creationism or intelligent design. And of course, you said to her, I, this has nothing to do with creationism. And I'm not talking about intelligent design. I'm just focusing on Darwin's own words. So then she comes back and says, well, you have to show how 
all of Darwin's problems, self-admitted problems with his theory have been resolved by modern scientific evidence, as if she's basically presupposing what the scientific answer has to be. She's not allowing for the possibility that some of these are unresolved. So you reply back saying, look, I'm not aware of how these have been resolved. And of course, very clearly, some of them have not been resolved. I mean, let's talk about the transitional forms in the fossil record. Multiple of your problems with Darwin's theory refer to that, and that remains a problem to this day that's widely acknowledged in the technical literature. So then she falls back to another argument, which is, okay, you're not aligned with the framework or the standards. What is she talking about there, Herm, when she talks about your poster has to reference framework-aligned teaching approaches and has to align with this framework. What framework is she talking about? Uh, that's a good question. And there's lots of scientific standards now being referred to at these conferences. You have the next generation science standards, then there's some framework. There's a lot of different standards, a lot of jargon they throw around. Yeah, I mean, but even the next generation science standards leave the door cracked open for using inquiry-based education. For example, the NGSS state that if new evidence is discovered that the theory does not accommodate, the theory is generally modified. Okay, well, you're aligned with that. You're showing how there's data that doesn't fit Darwin's theory. And so this means that maybe his theory needs to be modified. And it has been modified to neo-Darwinian theory, but maybe it still needs to be modified more because it doesn't explain some of this evidence, even after 150 years. And of course, science standards in these frameworks are usually viewed as a floor rather than a ceiling for what must be taught in schools. It's not the case that everything that a science teacher says has to be within the bounds of the science standards. They're the minimum of what you have to teach, but maybe what you're giving is additional information that teachers might want to know about when they're teaching evolution. And re regardless, as you said, Herm, none of the other posters were being subjected to this kind of a requirement. I mean, I'm sure that they did not call anybody else up and says, give us the framework standards that you're aligned with. Of course, not even telling you what framework she's talking about. But, you know, I don't think they did this to anybody else. So it does seem pretty obvious that they just wanted to get rid of you and they did not want a talk at their conference that is referencing problems in Darwin's theory. Yeah, that's quite clear. I did attend a, a webinar that they were having for poster presenters that was on February 22nd. And they didn't say anything about, you know, you had to cite uh, framework aligned teaching approaches. They didn't say anything about that. It's pretty much wide open what you could do. And they were very encouraging to just do what you want to do and be creative. They didn't give any specifications like that. In fact, they, I don't think they gave any specifications, just that they told you how much space you're going to have in your table. And then you're supposed to put up your poster there and have some handouts and talk to the people. So it's pretty wide open. So what would you say that all of this says about the state of free speech and science education today if you can't even quote Darwin talking about problems with his own theory? <laughs> it says it's in a sad state of affairs. I mean, a scientific organization in theory is supposed to be open to debate, open to considering other perspectives. But the way the, these mainstream scientific organizations are now it comes to Darwinian evolution, they're so closed-minded. They don't even want to consider what Darwin says about his own theory. They don't want to encourage any debate, even debate that was fostered by Darwin himself. It's really bad. It, there was a, a gentleman who testified before Congress a few weeks ago. He talked about the censorship industrial complex that's being run now by the scientific and technological elite in our country. They have their own narrative. And they try to shut down any debate that's counter to that narrative. And uh, Eisenhower warned about the military-industrial complex. Well, this gentleman, Mr. Schellenberger, he was warning about the censorship-industrial complex that we now have in our country. And it really does uh, stymie debate and freedom of speech. And you've been at this for quite a few years, Herm. You have been uh, dealing with science education since 1998. You're aware that this is not a new problem, actually, in science education. It's not like this just came around in the last couple of years since the cancel culture, quote unquote, arose. Science education has been canceling teachers and canceling those who want to express and discuss scientific problems with Darwinian evolution for many, many years. And this really is a problem of censorship. It's a problem of groupthink and censorship and not willing to actually teach students how to think when it comes to hot topics like evolution, instead they want to teach students what to think 
uh, and not let them ask hard questions. And we at Discovery Institute have been battling this problem for a long time. And I'm I'm sorry that you fell victim to it, but you've got a lot of courage, Herm. So my, my final question is, what do you think? Are you going to give the NSTA uh, another chance to possibly open their minds and allow you to talk about what Darwin said about problems with evolution? Oh, definitely, Casey. I haven't given up yet. I'm, I still plan to keep trying to open up their minds and get them to let me present. I feel a little bit like Charlie Brown and uh, dealing with Lucy, who's he's trying to trust Lucy to uh, hold the football for him while he kicks it. And it usually doesn't work out well for him. I don't think it ever worked out well for him. So I feel a little bit like Charlie Brown, but I'm going to keep trying and Hopefully, eventually, they'll start to see the light and be a little bit more open to other perspectives, at least the Darwin's perspectives. They should listen to Darwin. I hope so, too, Herm. You're doing good work there. And I want to remind our listeners that it is not illegal to critique Darwin in schools. And in fact, doing this, it would be supported by the highest levels of science education theorists. It's just that they sort of jettison all of this good science education theory that says it's it's good pedagogical practice to talk about the evidence for and against evolution, and they jettison all that when it comes to the teaching of evolution. I'm just going to read a couple of quotes here that I'll leave our listeners with. There was a paper in the journal Science by Stanford science education theorist Jonathan Osborne, which said that critique is not, therefore, some peripheral feature of science, but rather core to its practice. And he says that studies show that students will best understand science when learning to discriminate between evidence that supports inclusive or does not support exclusive, unquote, of a particular theory. The U.S. Congress declared in the No Child Rough Behind Act conference report that a quality science education should prepare students to distinguish the data and testable theories of science from religious or philosophical claims that remain in the name of science and where topics are taught that may generate controversy, such as biological evolution, The curriculum should help students to understand the full range of scientific views that exist, unquote. The U.S. Supreme Court has stated that it is legal to teach scientific critiques of prevailing scientific theories. They state, quote, we do not imply that a legislature can never require that scientific critiques of prevailing scientific theories be taught, unquote. And of course, Charles Darwin himself famously stated that a fair result can be obtained only by stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. So I think, Herm, what you are encouraging science teachers to do has a good legal, pedagogical, and scientific backing and foundation, and I think you should keep doing it. So thank you, Herm, and please keep up the good work. Thank you very much, Casey. I appreciate that, and I appreciate this opportunity to publicize this, what happened at the NSDA conference this year. Well, let's hope that they'll open their minds in the future to hearing about what, you know, really the way that evolution should be taught, teaching it scientifically, allowing students to hear about its problems. I'm Casey Luskin with ID the Future. Thanks for listening. Visit us at idthefuture.com and intelligentdesign.org. This program is Copyright Discovery Institute and recorded by its Center for Science and Culture.